Living the Faith podcast, brought to you by Restoring the Faith Media, restoringthefaith.com. This is a very special edition of the Living the Faith podcast coming at you from the Living the... the sorry, this isn't the Living the Faith studio. This nope. is the Living the Faith show, which is on the Restoring the Faith <laughs> studio platform. This is the RTF studio. We're here live live for us anyway, from the heart of America, where we're talking today about this show will be released on one of the greatest feasts of all time. One of the, be- one of the very best feasts in the whole church. One of my favorite. Um, so we're just recording a couple evenings before the assumption, the assumption of our lady. And we should probably define first that, um, what the assumption is it's celebrated every year on August 15th. And uh, we have some some notes about it, some preliminary notes that we would like to get through before we start talking about really interesting aspects of the feast. Blow that are, your mind. That are heretofore unconsidered, I think, in the minds of most people, certainly in our own minds. Certainly. Definitely. So, yes, of course, in case anybody didn't know, this is a Holy Day of Obligation. Oh, uh, so. that's a good point. You have to go to Mass today. We're releasing the show in the very early morning hours. Today. Today, (laughs) on the 15th. We're coming at you today on the morning of the 15th, and we're telling you right now, it's a holy day of obligation, period. Be there. So, don't miss out. Don't miss out. Why is it a holy day of obligation? Well, it is one of... So, of course, at least in in, in the States, we have the easy breakdown of the... Holy Days of Obligation uh, that you would have heard um, about, which are the the three for Our Lord, two for Our Lady, and one for the saints. So this is only one of two for Our Lady. That's correct. You can't mess this one up. No, no, you can't. It's interesting, uh, some interesting facts around this, right? So this was only, this has always been believed uh, by all Catholics everywhere. In all times and all places by all peoples, uh, to use the... um, the formula for what constitutes yes. um, the <laughs> um, so, but it was only recently dogmatically defined mm-hmm. um, in mm-hmm, wait for it munificentissimus munificentissimus Deus. I got I, it right the first time. I, you had it right. I was I was like wow. Say Deus. He got it. <laughs> <laughs> munificentissimus Deus. Yes. Try saying that fast five times. Yes, and that was promulgated when nineteen fifty. So, wow. So that would have been Pius the uh, 12th. You got it. You got 1950. it. 1950. Interesting little factoid around, about it as well. Uh, it is the first infallible statement that was made uh-huh. since the the principle or the dogma of papal infallibility was enacted. Was defined. Right. Defined in the first Vatican Council. Wow. So you're telling me, for, I mean, because you're, you're talking 1950s. Plus or minus a hundred years after Vatican One. I'm sorry, Vatican One. Yes, Vatican One back in the 1850s, right? Right. So uh, it it took the popes a hundred years before any of them spoke dogmatically from the chair of Peter. So it's kind of cheating a little bit, the factoid, but it is yeah. a true factoid. Yeah. The one before that was the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. Okay. So the well, that was 1850. I the, thought yes, during the. The first Vatican that was council. during the council. Yes. Right. Okay. So all, right, all right. All right. This is the first time that it had been used again. Again. Since the uh, since the enactment of it. So interesting. Almost exactly a hundred years. It seems like. Yep. From 1850 to 1950. We like to do things in hundreds in the church. Two things about Our Lady, and there's like nothing in between. But from 1850 to 1950, you basically just have popes trying to defend the church from the onslaught of mm-hmm. modernism mm-hmm. Um, uh, and and not defining any new dogma. Right. And notice the one before at the First Vatican Council. Yeah. That was the Immaculate Conception, like yeah. I said. So those happen to be <laughs> the two holy days of obligation. And they've that always we been. Have. Right. Yeah. Okay. So it's just it's it's very interesting from that from that perspective. Well, Immaculate right. Conception I don't think has always been a holy day of obligation. Uh, has it, you're you're probably right, right about that. It's always been believed. Right. 
Certainly. Um, okay, so the dogma of the assumption says that our lady's body is has been assumed into heaven. Body and soul. Body and soul assumed. are both in heaven. Yes. So both she she is she has one of the only bodies that is in heaven right now. Correct. You've got our Lord's body, mm-hmm. and then you've got Elijah's body. Nope. No. Mm-mm. Not in heaven. He, he didn't. He uh, okay. Not All right. Heaven. But he, but his body is in the afterlife, right? No, Mm-mm. Elijah. But that—that's a very that is a, that is a long explanation. That's a sidebar. Itself. That's a sidebar. Okay. The only two bodies that are in heaven are our Lord's and our Lady's. Oh well, that very, makes it easy. Yes, just two. That makes it easy. Just two. As uh, the the venerable Dom Guerrier uh, said um, about this, our Lord had only a Father in heaven and only a mother on earth. And those two are now paired together in heaven. Of course, he had foster father in St. Joseph, and, mm-hmm. and of course, there's, there's Trinitarian stuff going on mm-hmm. with spiration and whatnot in between the Father and the Son and Holy Ghost and all mm-hmm. that. So, but to boil, when you boil it down that way, and in light of the office of the Queen Mother, mm-hmm. you know, you've got Solomon bending his knee to Bathsheba. Mm-hmm. Um, in her presence, and that the queen mother sits at the right hand of the king. Mm-hmm. So now, if Christ is the king of the universe and the king of kings, then of course he would prepare a throne at his right side for his mother. Correct. Yes, for her to sit in body and soul. Right. So um, it is uh, the 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 document that is is def- defines this as we refer to as munificentissimus deus. Yeah. Um, the, that document is extremely beautiful and elaborates very clearly what is being defined. So yeah. it's very important at the outset to understand there are many concepts and pious beliefs, theories, um, no assumptions other than the assumption. Um, I was wondering when yes, that joke was going to be it, made. It, it was going to come up. It, yeah. It's unavoidable, really. Um, but ma- many people have made assumptions about the assumption. Yes. We're yes. going to read some of them, too, yes. from St. Alphonsus Liguori and others. Um, it's interesting specifically around uh, uh, around that. But anyways, before we dive into that, I, I just want to make sure that we state it very clearly. The thing that we have to believe yeah. as Catholics, we, we are formal heretics if we do not believe this um, with full knowledge that this is what the truth teaches. So everybody knows now that Our Lady, her body and her soul assumed to heaven. They do not assume that they were joined before they left heaven necessarily. Mm -hmm. Um, It doesn't necessarily state that they were joined in heaven. So, there's a, there's so many possibilities there. I mean, because really, the definition of death is the separation of the soul from the body. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so, when you talk about Our Lady's, did she die? She she. It, a lot of people say that she did. Right. There's two schools of thought. And on some this. people say that she didn't. Mm-hmm. Right. And then what you're saying is that if her body and soul didn't arrive in heaven at the same time, then it's possible then that her soul went into purgatory for a time. And some and and I don't want to I don't want to shortcut all the pious beliefs, but what you're saying is, is that if her if her soul and her body didn't go together straight to heaven, mm. then there then there's pos- it's possible that they both took separate routes and met up there. No, no, it's it's not about it's about the timing, not the direction. It's the sequencing. It, it's this it's a sequencing, right? So they simultaneously went to heaven. Okay. By no by direct path, right? Assumed to heaven. No, no, no short paths, you know, shortcuts or anything like this. It was just body and the soul simultaneously. No, no emptying out of the souls of purgatory. That's yeah, well, that's, that, 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 that's that that's one of the pious assumptions. Yes, about the yes, assumption. Yes, that's that's true. That's true. Okay, yeah. I, you've got you fair point. Okay, Th- this this is I'm just this is a theory, right? But the the point is is that they went together. Mm. That the and I don't know what that means. Necessarily, again, they didn't necessarily have to be joined. Yeah, but they both went to heaven by direct by by 
a path. It's again, it's it's interesting. You just have to be very clear about how you say these things, right? I don't. Neither do yes. I want to be a material heretic here. No, 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 no. We don't like heretics. So, um, anyways, even accidental heretics. Yes, right. So, what is interesting and what is allowed for in what you can believe yeah. and remain Catholic is there's two kind of schools of thought. Our Lady did in fact die, or she did not die. Yeah, she went to sleep. She went to sleep. Right. Now, the interest. Uh, basically, let let's but let's put it this way to make it easy for the people for people to follow. One is is that she did not die, and one is it's that she died. Okay. The more popular belief and m- one that has the most defense for it. And also the one that seems most proper, surprisingly, is is that she did die. That she did die. Mm-hmm. I thought you were going to say that she didn't die. So I was under this mis- misunderstanding for a long time myself because I'd always attached myself to the concept of the dormition, which is to say that Our Lady did not die. Yeah, because there was no suffering, mm-hmm. um, and you know she just kind of very peacefully slipped into heaven. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. No, and and. And it seems like a less violent thing. Right, exactly. I mean, and, and, and I, don't, I don't mean violence in terms of like violent video games. I, sure. I mean in terms of the theological definition of violence, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which the, the separation of the soul from the body, which is the definition of death, mm-hmm. is inherently a violent thing. Correct. So I would have thought, oh, okay, well, then her soul wasn't separated from her body. They just slipped in. Right. But that's not, that that's not, not the, case. the case. Well. Let's just say that is the one that is not the prevailing. That's not the probable case. Probable case. Okay. It is. It does not seem to be the most fitting. It does not seem to be the most probable. Okay. Um, for a variety of reasons, and okay. there's a lot of references about that. So let's dive into that a little bit. Mm-hmm. So if we think about the uh, a, a lot of the reasons why people might think that Our Lady did not die before she was assumed, is because she was the new Eve. Mm-hmm. And so that since she, she was not affected, born immaculately conceived, right, would it get, which again had only been defined 100 years prior to the definition of this dogma, yep. um, that she would not have to suffer death because Eve would not have had to suffer death because she, that is an effect of original sin that we die. Okay. It is unnatural for the body yes. to be separated from the soul. So that is an effect of original sin, which Our Lady it would seem proper that she did not have to endure. The interesting thing about that, though, is is that our Lord also did not have to endure that. Of course not. Right. Exactly. Of course not. But he chose to. Right. And in the, and this brings into a very another interesting debate, but again, which is prevailing and which is, it is not a defined dogma, but it is defended by tradition, by the fathers and the doctors of the church, but there is still some debate about the concept of the co-redemptrix, Our Lady being the co-redemptrix, yeah. which means is that she merited also for our salvation alongside of Christ. Which, if if there was if there were going to be a dogmatic statement given at the Second Vatican Council, which there wasn't, um, and they never they never made anything dogmatic. Um, it was pastoral in nature, but if there was going to be something dogmatic, that was going to be the thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the Cardinals were going into Vatican II saying, Mm -hmm. we're going to formally appropriate the title to Our Lady, Mm -hmm. which she so, uh, so obviously deserves, which is co-mediatrix of all Mm -hmm. graces and and co-redemptress. That would have been the trifecta, immaculate conception, the assumption, right. And then, co-redemptrix. Yeah, and then you would have, and then boom, Our Lady would uh, would have been wearing all the titles, which she actually, ob- in an objective way, is wearing those titles, bearing those titles in heaven right now. She has those titles regardless of what we think about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we would have just come to the understanding of the objective truth and the re- mm-hmm. and conformed our thought to the reality of the thing. So mm-hmm. um, that would have been nice. Um, I'm trying to find, there's a quote here where, uh, yeah, here it is. So, from the day when it was said, the Lord is with thee, the grace was irrevocable, the unity inseparable, and in speaking of the glory of the Son and Mother, we must call it not so much a common glory as the self-same glory, which in effect what, what, what he's saying here is what you're saying. Mm. It's the same th- glory. It's this, it, they're so united 
mm-hmm. mother and son. They are so inexec- uh, in- inexorably. Inexorably. Yes. Yeah. yeah, you're getting all the pronunciations today. <laughs> that, yeah, it makes sense that she would follow the exact path that her son Absolutely. took. Yep, Absolutely. And in, right into heaven. So if she is the co-redemptrix, which again, all the evidence points to, I know people have some yeah. debates about that nowadays, but um, that's fine. It, leave it, a, it, leave right. a comment on the, on the Facebook page. There Absolutely. are 4,000 people who can uh, debate this thing. Yeah, uh, at, please do. It, with charity and, and, and men of goodwill. Yeah, please provide and, references though. Emotional arguments aren't going to win anybody over. Yeah, so. I know. I really, I hate me. I hate having to delete Facebook. comments. <laughs> Facebook arguments. We have a lot uh, better to do. Also, leave a comment in, uh, or, or leave a comment in the YouTube channel as well. We appreciate that. So yeah, so she follows the exact same path that her son followed. That okay, that argument right there makes a lot of sense mm-hmm. to me. Yeah, and and it, it the the what well, from what I can read and see glean from the fathers and doctors yeah. is is that it's it is the most befitting that she that it it happened this way that she did choose. Yeah. Uh, in in a manner of speaking, right, that she accepted it. Um, yeah. The dying like her son mm-hmm. died, not mm-hmm. in the same manner, but that her body and her soul were separated mm-hmm. for a time. Mm-hmm. Now, the interesting thing is, is that if you're going down the befitting route, that would also seem to indicate, again, not dogmatically, but it would also seem to indicate that she resurrected before she died, or before she was assumed, rather that she resurrected before so that, she was assumed. Yeah, right. So she, w- so she was put in a tomb, right, and then they went back, and she was gone. That's this is this is how that that happened, right? So okay. and um, see, and then then you go then you start to go down that path where you're like, okay, I've heard these very uh, pious stories about how she you know, uh, had emptied out purgatory and that would have been the time if that were to have happened, that would have been mm-hmm. the opportunity for her to do that as her body lay dormant on earth, mm-hmm. her soul separated from her body. So IE death, mm-hmm. her soul goes and empties out purgatory and then her soul is reunited to her body on earth mm-hmm. where from she is then assumed into heaven, body and soul. Right which would have been uh, a perfect emulation of our Lord with the following exception. And this is something that, once again, uh, Dom Guéranger, uh, is that, I'm not a French guy. I don't... Guéranger. Uh, Dom Guéranger. This is. is what he... You have um, to do it the little... Do you mm. have to... Well, no one's no one's actually watching. They're all listening, so you... But there are, there's a YouTube. I know there's a YouTube. <laughs> but I, I maintain that many of our listeners... Uh, particularly um, our our lady listeners who are perhaps at home uh, feeding and, and clothing and diapering babies and cooking uh, while they're listening to this. They probably go to YouTube, turn on the show, listen to the audio, but they don't, they, actually, they can't see my hand swirling. <laughs> Maybe they picked up their phone at this point. I'm swirling my hand. I don't get on job. No, that wasn't right. All right, so as the venerable... Um, and as, as he said, um, there is a dissimilarity... Mm-hmm. Between the assumption of Our Lady and um, our our Lord's glorious entrance into heaven, and that is sort of the tonality around the event, mm-hmm. because you've got Our Lord who is who is effectively beaten to death. I mean, just a bloody, bloody scene, and he's and he's crucified, and he dies, and he's buried, and there's this very emotional event, mm-hmm. um, and then he resurrects. And then he's with us for a time. Sometimes we recognize him. Sometimes we don't even recognize him. Mm-hmm. It's all very confusing. He's speaking to us, but it's like we're so dumb that we don't understand what right. he's telling us. Right. And then he ascends into heaven. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of emotion, okay? Mm-hmm. Volatility is at max. You go from extreme sadness to extreme joy to surprise to you're kind of in this stupor with Our Lady... It is perfectly peaceful. It is the epitome of peacefulness, in mm-hmm. fact. And I think that it was meant to be that way. Our Lord wanted it to be that way. Look. Um, well, I mean, if you think about it from from the perspective, again, being the co-redemptrix. Yeah. She already endured a passion. 
That's right. With Christ oh, along right. the way, right? And we can all see that. It, it, was, fore- it, was, very it was all foretold to her yes. by Simeon. I mm-hmm. mean, yeah. I mean, her she, heart's going to be endured. pierced by a sword. Yes. And she did. And yes, and, and, and had been enduring and mm. continued to endure. So uh, being without her, her Savior. So this was a, 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 a blessing um, for her. Right. Uh, to, right. To, to die in this way. So well, it's just and interesting. Sa- from I mean, that. And St. Louis de Montfort says that the moon is her footstool. I mean, this is how important and powerful this creature is. Mm-hmm. This is the highest, most beautiful, most perfect creature that God created. Mm-hmm. And um, the moon is her footstool. The stars are created f- to, for her own glory and, um, and, and to be something beautiful for her to look at. Mm-hmm. So when she passes into heaven, it's a very peaceful event. But I'm sure that the reaction when she got there was pretty exciting. Very, very much so. We, um, I don't know. Do we believe this? Is this the appropriate time to bring in this story, this uh, secret weapon? Uh, I, we I, I think we should. You know what? I don't know. Wait, we could be Gnostics and just and just keep this secret knowledge to ourselves. And not share it with people, uh, but but we're Catholic. But we should probably share it. <laughs> All right, bring it out. Bring out the big guns. Okay. So uh, you were reading the the liturgical year, which is a very very yes. important resource. We've referenced it before. We'll continue to reference it again. And um, but you, I, my WhatsApp is on, so I should probably turn that off. <laughs> <laughs> but there's another resource that you are referencing here. Mm-hmm. And oh, it's not me. No, nope. it was the computer. That, that well, technically, it was me. Anyways, I was being nice. I just said it wasn't me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's like, "Well, if it's not Mike, <laughs> there that, could be somebody off camera, right?" I, that darn producer of ours, he yes. just is not up to his <laughs> A game. It happen. We need a new producer. We're recruiting for a producer here at the Restore the Face Studio. If anyone would like to live in the heart of America, and um, all right, so secret weapon, Joe. Um. This is a, a, um, a little excerpt from The Glories of Mary by St. Alphonsus Liguri, uh, also a very wonderful book. Um, we will hope to be um, producing a, a mi- mini-series oh, that would be amazing. E- examples of these beautiful stories um, about Our Lady. Um, so more to come on that. Um, you'll see why this is important for you to tune in to that at a later time. I did not know that there was an actual relation of the event of Our Lady's passing. But uh, St. Alphonsus quotes uh, Cedrinus, Nisiphorius, and Metaphrastes, um, relating that some days before her death, our Lord sent the Archangel Gabriel, the same who announced her that she was the blessed woman chosen to be the mother of God. Mm. My Lady and Queen said the angel... God has already graciously heard thy holy desires and has sent me to tell thee to prepare thyself to leave the earth, for he wills thee in heaven. Come then to take possession of thy kingdom, for I and all its holy inhabitants await and desire thee. On this happy annunciation, what else could our most humble and most holy virgin do but with the most profound humility reply in the same words in which she had answered St. Gabriel, when he announced to her that she was to become the mother of God. Mm. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Behold, she answered again, the slave of the Lord. Mm. He in his pure goodness chose me and made me his mother. He now calls me to paradise. I did not deserve that honor, neither do I deserve this. But since he is pleased to show in my good person, in, in my person, his infinite liberality, behold, I am ready to go where he pleases. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. May the will of my God and Lord be ever accomplished in me. And uh, he further relates, after receiving this welcome intelligence, she imparted it to St. John. We may well imagine what grief and tender feelings he heard the news. He who had for so many years attended upon her as a son and enjoyed the heavenly conversation of this most holy mother. She then uh, visited Jerusalem, um, taking leave uh, of them and visiting Mount Calvary, where her beloved son had died. Then she retired to, into her poor cottage there to prepare for her death. 
During this time, the angels visited her, um, and many authors even assert that before her death, the apostles and also many of the disciples who were scattered in different parts of the world were miraculously assembled in Mary's room. Wow. And that when she saw all of her dear children in her presence, she addressed them. Um, I'm going to leave this for the show. I think you should. There's there's, there's a, a lot more. There's a very, very beautiful story about this. Yeah. The Glories of Mary, um, and... It is something that will give you one of the one of the very few that will truly give you an intense and holy um, love for Our Lady. It will it, it will cer- certainly do that. It can melt even the hardest heart. It is truly amazing. That, I, that's that's something, man. That is something. You know, uh, I had someone once uh, go on a a cruise in the Mediterranean and, and, uh, this person is related to me and he's, and he's not of the Catholic faith. Mm. And, um, he went to, uh, what is advertised as our lady's house in Ephesus, which is in modern day Turkey. Mm. Um, and he said, Oh yes, this is a wonderful, you know, it's so wonderful to see the place where, you know, where the great Mary, the, the great mother of, of, uh, Christ, uh, what died. Mm-hmm. And I kind of told him, I'm like, you know, we've got the skull of St. Peter. Do you not think that we would have some bodily relics of our lady if any were available? I mean, think about that. Mm-hmm. I mean, we have, we have relics, bodily relics, like bones from contemporary from from contemporaneous time per- period right you've got it from yeah from basically Peter's ba- basically bones. all the apostles yes right i mean we don't have all st peter's bones some no no so yeah. given away but yeah um anyways uh, no it, it, it it's just it's amazing it's it's shocking it's if, like if it's it, like also the same reason why people when people say oh yeah why why is it that you don't have st joan of arc's bones uh, um, <laughs> right. It's different. Um, anyways, the point is, and I, th- I think a, a very important point to this is this was a, actually a controversial uh, encyclical, even in 1950. Um, yeah. we're dealing a lot with heretics nowadays mm-hmm. in, mm-hmm. uh, in and without, um, sure. and <laughs> within and without. Yeah. Yes. And, it behooves us as Catholics to clasp even more firmly yeah. on uh, on our faith and on specific parts of our faith. This is why encyclicals are written, right? Encyclicals are not saying, hey, guess what, guys? We're going to proclaim this. And everybody's like, oh, no. No, everybody's like, yes, we know that. Yeah. But there's a reason why it's being done now because it yeah. is against something, a flow that is going on in the church. And right, right now— the Protestants do not wish to honor Mary and Mass. No, no they don't. Um, they 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 hate the Mass, um, and and they certainly they certainly hate our reverence for um, for our Holy Mother. And I think your your point to to say it exactly to say exactly what you said, but just a different way. Even as long ago, so it seems as 1950. 1950 seems like a long time ago. It's like 70 years almost. Yes. But even 70 years ago, this was a controversial encyclical because the dogma had come under so much attack and disbelief mm-hmm. by the articulation of forces that are all joined together to destroy our faith um, piece by piece. And a major part of that is our devotion to Our Lady. Mm-hmm. And so you have, you know, you've, You've got Freemasons. You've got Protestants. You've got heretics. Yep. Jews and Muslims. Yep. Um, you've got schismatics and 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 people who are just what novelists, noveltists, mm-hmm. noveltists, right? People who enjoy novelty, right? Mm-hmm. And all of that was happening even in the 1950s. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There is there is a uh, I forget the name of the Protestant theologian who was asking of another. Uh, well, uh, 
prominent Protestant theologian. For some reason, I have a problem with those three words being in one sentence. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> prominent Protestant theologian. Yeah, it's it's yeah it's PBT. I don't know. <laughs> it just doesn't sound right. Anyways, yeah. uh, the point was is that he was he was a, pro, a prominent Protestant at the time, and he was asked. His name was uh, Reinhold Niebuhr. All right, and he was asked about eight months before the encyclical was written because there were rumblings that yeah, this was going to be proclaimed because there you, you would not believe the amount of priests and bishops and, and re- religious that were begging that this dogma be pronounced so that end all debate and question about this because this is not acceptable. We've always yeah. believed this. And he was asked this, and he said, again, in 1950. Yeah, Prati prod, alert. Here, right. here we go. I don't think so. He is too clever for that. He, Pius XII, uh-huh. it would be a slap in the face of the modern world, and it would be dangerous for the Roman church to do that today. Oh, wow. So he's too... <laughs> that, that is a big... Wow. Whoa, that Our Lady assumed body and soul into heaven... Uh, this is something that we take for granted, which we all know to be the case. Right? It's not. It's as probably. Catholics. I mean, it's sadly, it's probably not something that's prominently taught in most parishes. It's just not. While it remains a feast day and a holy day of obligation mm-hmm. in the United States, this is just not something that you hear from the pulpit mm-hmm. that often. Yeah, it's true. In in mass, no. And mass. Uh, that was a bad. And mass. Yes, bad okay. pun. Anyways. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the point is, is, is that this is a um, beautiful, beautiful feast day. Yeah, let's take this opportunity to celebrate. Let's do that on this day. This is find a, great a copy feast day. of the glories of Mary. Take take this feast day, which begins the forty day Saint Michael's Lent, which we're going to talk about, and take it seriously. Spend forty days understanding Our Lady more deeply, and let's do that together. Living the Faith Podcast, brought to you by Restoring the Faith Media, restoringthefaith.com.